Now we come to topic number two, mucogingival conditions in the natural dentition. And this is based our discussions on an expert paper written by Sandro Cortellini and Nabil Bisada. And uh, again, a few critical questions were phrased and we came up with answers. And um, for example, we were phrasing the question, what are the possible consequences of gingival recession and root surface exposure to oral environment? Next question, is the development of gingival recession associated with the gingival phenotype? Is a certain amount in terms of thickness and width of gingiva necessary to maintain pedantal health? Does improper toothbrushing influence the development and progression of gingival recessions? Does intracircular restorative margin placement influence the development of gingival recession? And finally, what is the effect of orthodontic treatment on the development of gingival recession? Well, possible consequences of gingival recession and root surface exposure to the oral environment are listed here. Impaired aesthetics, of course. Dentin hypersensitivity. Carious or non-carious cervical lesions. And CCL. And it has to be stated that the prevalence of dentin hypersensitivity, cervical carious and non-carious cervical, cervical lesions is high. And the presence of these NCCLs increases with age. So these are known facts. Second question, is the development of gingival recession associated with the gingival phenotype? Well, the pedantic phenotype is determined by gingival phenotype. And this refers to the thickness of the gingiva and the width of the colonized tissue. And the bone morphotype what is the thickness of the buccal bone plate? Now, a thin phenotype increases the risk for gingival recession. How thin is thin? Well, there's an easy way to measure this. Uh, if a pedantic probe is visible, this would mean that the gingiva is most likely thin, up to one millimeters of thickness. If a pedantic probe is not visible when we introduce it into the sulcus, then we are dealing with a thick phenotype more than one millimeter. There are more, more sophisticated ways to measure this, but this is an easy way to assess it clinically. It is also known that a person with a thin phenotype is more prone to develop increasing recession lesions over time. Uh, regarding gingival width, regarding toothbrushing, regarding the margin placement, these were the questions I phrased in the beginning. Is there a certain amount of gingival necessary to maintain periodontal health? Based on all the studies, based on the evidence, uh, we came to the conclusion that any amount of gingival is sufficient to maintain periodontal health when optimal oral hygiene is attainable. Does improper toothbrushing influence the development and progression of gingival recessions? Another important question. And here, in fact, the data, the evidence are inconclusive. Some studies report a positive association, some a negative one, and some no association at all. And finally, does intracircular restorative margin placement influence the development of gingival recession? And here the answer we came up with was that such a margin placement may be associated with the development of gingival recession, particularly in a thin periodontal phenotype. Next question, what is the effect of orthodontic treatment on the development of gingival recession? Well, it is known that gingival recessions following orthodontic therapy, and this is mainly on the effect of mandibular incisor proclination have been observed in various studies with a prevalence ranging from 5 to 12 percent. And authors report an increase of prevalence up to 47 percent in long term, meaning five years and more observations. 
The direction of the tooth movement and the buccolingual thickness of the gingiva may play important roles in soft tissue alteration during orthodontic treatment. So in the end, uh, we came up with case definitions. A case with gingival recession presents with an apical shift of the gingival margin, what is called the recession depth. And of course, this is not enough. There are relevant features for this condition, and they are listed here. The interdental clinical attachment level, the gingival phenotype that we talked about, the root surface condition that we already mentioned, presence or absence of NCCL or caries, the detection of the cemento enamel junction, CEJ, the tooth position, the apparent frenum, the number of adjacent recessions, and in fact it has to be stated, and this is well known, that the presence of recession can cause aesthetic problems and can be associated with dentin hypersensitivity. So the classification of mucogingival conditions, the gingival phenotype and the gingival recessions, in order to organize it in a structured way, uh, we developed this matrix. And you see here two uh, factors are uh, taken into consideration, the gingival site and the tooth site. On the gingival site, we have to look at the recession depth, the thickness of the gingiva, the width of the keratinized tissues. On the tooth side, we have to look at the CJ, whether it's visible or not visible. And also, we have to state and document whether there's a step uh, concavity on the root surface or not. And I will show you examples in a minute. When it comes to the actual recession, uh, we um, adopted uh, an established system developed by Cairo et al. in 2011. And here the recessions are actually uh, classified into three groups, recession type one, type two, and type three. And I'm going to explain this in a minute. Coming back to the root surface condition, tooth side step, plus or minus, and this refers to a classification developed by Pino Prato and co-authors in 2010. Plus meaning, well, we do have a cervical step, a root surface concavity that is bigger than 0.5 millimeters. The absence indicated by minus would mean uh, there's a cervical step less or maximum of five millimeters. Okay, now I will uh, explain the recession types in more detail. Remember there were three recession types, one, two, and three, and um, recession type one, RT1, those are gender recessions without interproximal attachment loss. Clinically, uh, the CJ on the approximal surface is not detectable, and this is an example taken from the original publication by Cairo et al, 2011. And this is showing you a typical example for a recession of type one. Recession type two in this classification would relate to recessions with interproximal attachment loss. However, the approximal attachment loss is equal or smaller than the vestibular attachment loss. So we do have to measure the attachment on the vestibular site, but also on the interproximal site, as you see here with the illustrations on the right side. And again, the approximal attachment loss has to be equal or less than the vestibular one in order to classify this recession as type two. And finally, the most advanced type would be the RT3, and those are again recessions with interproximal attachment loss. However, here the aproximal attachment loss is bigger, is higher than the vestibular attachment loss indicated by the probe inserted in the tissues here and related the measurement to the CEJ. So this would be an example for RT3. Now we come back to the tooth side, to the root surface condition. 
root surface discrepancies, whether they are there or not. And here we have a four different classes and they are listed here. Four different scenarios are class A, class B, class A, the CJ is visible, class B, the CJ is not visible due to, for example, aberration. And this can be happening without a step indicated by minus or with a step indicated by plus. So four different possibilities in order to describe the root surface condition. And this is illustrated here. So in type A, you do see the cement enamel junction. It's easily detectable. You see it from the facial, you see it from the approximal in this illustration here. Um, the plus or the minus is indicating a step and in the A plus you can detect the CJ but you do have a step. Now if we come to the other two uh, scenarios and this would be scenarios where the CJ is not visible anymore due to a root surface uh, operation due to some discrepancies and this could be without over the step indicated by the minus or the plus. The B plus you can easily see in this schematic drawing are uh, that we have uh, difficulties to detect the CJ. It's not possible to see the CJ anymore and this is due to a large surface defect we have on the root surface. So this is basically covering all the different scenarios that we can encounter in the clinic. Uh, this may seem complicated, but in the end this is very important when it comes to uh, uh, making treatment planning decisions. So uh, this RT1, 2 and 3 is related to actually different possibilities, different chances to obtain complete or only partial wood coverage. Uh, so if a patient with the appearance here on the right side comes to you to your practice, you actually have to do a tooth by tooth assessment, looking at the gingival conditions, looking at the recession type, but also looking at the root surface condition and uh, sort it into this matrix that we have shown you. And then you can come up with good treatment decisions because not all recessions can be treated the same way. And so this uh, careful analysis is very important for adequate treatment planning.